Hello there and welcome to AC's webinar on getting your business ready for the incoming GDPR regulations which come into force on in May 2018. My name is Wendy Lesbik and I'm the Director of HR uh, for the Association for Consultancy and Engineering and I have here with me Chris Sider and Joe Vengandansen from Pennington Manchies who will be presenting to us today. Chris and Joe are book partners at Pennington's, they are a law firm and AC affiliate. Before we start, I just thought it was important to um, set the ground rules for the webinar this afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to remind you to keep your headphones handy and your microphones muted. Also, um, just to, for you all to be aware that the webinar content will be followed by Q&A, so that will be an opportunity uh, for you to ask your questions. Kindly key in your questions on the questions section in your GoToWebinar control panel. If time permits, all the questions will be answered. If not, our presenters this afternoon will pick the most popular questions and answer them. Finally, and we did get this question already, we will be sending all attendees the recording of this webinar as soon as the session ends. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Wendy. My name's Joanne Vengadesen, and um, as Wendy mentioned, I'll be presenting together with my partner, Chris Sider. So um, just so you know, both uh, of us specialize in data protection from slightly different angles. Chris is an employment partner, and he'll be focusing on the data protection issues from an employee-employer perspective. And I um, focus on the data protection issues from a broader compliance perspective, particularly in relation to commercial relationships and general compliance. So um, that's how um, we will be um, f fitting in with your presentation today. Um, so I'll kick off with um, the overview. GDPR, what is it? Um, when do we have to care about it and why? Um, as you'll probably know, um, the GDPR is a new EU regulation which is set to replace the current data protection laws. Um, this will work together with a revised UK Data Protection Act. Um, we know that even though this is European law, um, the government is very keen for the law to continue to apply despite Brexit. In fact, it comes into force directly as law in the UK on the 25th of May 2018, when we are still going to be an EU member state. So it will be law from then. Um, we have received assurances um, from the UK government that uh, they want similar laws to continue to apply even in 2019 when we cease to be an EU member. So it's extremely important um, to understand that these laws are here to stay um, and it is important to start preparing to ensure that we comply. So why has there been this um, wide sweeping reform of the data protection laws? The motivation really was um, because the Data Protection Act, um, uh, the previous laws have been in force for some time, um, and they're really rather outdated in terms of technological advances that have taken place since then. And the use and collection of personal information through technologies is far more widespread now than it was when the laws were, the, old, the current laws were, were put together. So the aim of the GDPR is to achieve greater harmonization across the EU and also to ensure that individuals' rights are strengthened um, to, to, to ensure that organizations take due care of privacy when processing personal information. The reason it's so important, um, firstly, it creates an increased regulatory burden in terms of what you need to do in order to comply. And we will look at exactly how that, it, that is um, in this session. Um, and the reason it's grabbed many headlines uh, across the press and why so many organizations are um, paying it much more attention than the current laws is because the sanctions have significantly increased. Um, at the moment, the maximum that the UK regulator can fine for a significant data breach is £500,000. And as you can see from the figure on our slide, the maximum penalties that the GDPR brings in are quite considerably higher than that. 
Um, we're looking at maximum figures of 20 million euros at the moment or 4% of a global annual turnover of a group of companies. Um, we still don't know exactly how these fines will be enforced, of course, but um, we can see from the, um, the maximum figures that are there that um, they're likely to be higher than what we're used to under current law, most certainly. In addition, we anticipate that there will be more claims from individuals, particularly because uh, they have enhanced rights and the increased transparency obligations on organizations means that individuals will be more aware of their rights and more likely to enforce them. And this picture overall creates um, a need for businesses to get ready to be GDPR compliant. So looking at some fundamentals of these laws, if you're familiar with the Data Protection Act at the moment, you'll be pleased to hear that the GDPR um, fundamentally maintains the same types of rules and approach, um, but it just describes them in a more granular way. So looking at how they pretty much say the same, the concepts of um, a data controller and a data processor that um, exist under current law remain, a controller being someone who has a determining role on why and how personal data is processed and used, and a processor, data processor being a party that just performs acts in order to, perform, to provide the service to the controller but having no independent determining role on how um, that data is processed. So, so these two types of um, roles are still maintained in the GDPR. The GDPR places most compliance obligations on a data controller, but brings in some new direct obligations on a processor. So if you are a processor, it's, it's particularly important for you to be aware of those. The overall core principles um, of fairness, having reasons for why you're processing personal information, being proportionate um, in terms of the information that you capture and use, um, some regulations on transferring that information outside the European economic area, um, these sorts of rules will still apply. Um, and having a legal basis for processing data differs depending on the kind of data, whether it is um, normal personal data or whether the, da the personal data um, benefits from special protection being sensitive or as the GDPR refers to its special category, personal data. So um, personal data is, is um, pretty much the same as in current law, data relating to a living individual who is identified or identifiable. Um, and you can see from the information there that it's it's fairly wide. Um, it includes things like expressions of opinion about the individual. When we when I say processing within the meaning of these laws, it is a, a very broad term. It means pretty much anything that you can do with personal data, holding it, storing it, deleting it, archiving it, sharing it, all those sorts of things are encapsulated within the term processing. Um, changes that the GDPR brings in, it confirms that um, uh, the, the definition of personal data is expanded slightly to um, specifically refer to things like online identifiers. When it comes to sensitive personal data, we will now be referring to these as special category data. Um, and even though the way that they are treated is slightly different in terms of expression in the GDPR, um, basically they do still receive special protection and you still need to have different and much more specific reasons for using this kind of information. And Chris will comment on this further in the employment context. Um, so the two new categories have been added as special category um, data. This is genetic data and biometric data. So for example, if you're using fingerprint identifiers um, or other personal information by way of access controls, that sort of thing, um, that is special category personal data. This is what the new data protection principles look like. Um, and uh, again, if you're familiar with the current data protection principles, they look fairly similar. Um, what we've tried to do here is to identify in the red where um, there's much more 
detail that's been brought in by the GDPR. Um, so I will just focus on highlighting these aspects. One of the really important things to understand is the concept of transparency. Um, it is becoming much more important to know exactly what and why you're doing with personal information so that you can be transparent to individuals about it. With data minimization, this is really the the, the concept of not processing more data than you need. Um, you need to consider this um, in quite um, a, a lot of detail to work out if you can use techniques to minimize or pseudonymize the information that you collect. Um, and uh, integrity, um, it really relates to the security of the systems and um, measures that you take to protect that information. Um, there's a, one further principle that's been brought in, really, which is which is accountability, and this is a principle that is going to have quite significant impact because you will need to be in a position to demonstrate how you comply um, with the GDPR. So, if the regulator contacts you to um, to ask you about your processes, you will need to be a able to easily demonstrate this is the data map of what you um, what you process in terms of personal information and this is how you treat it. So your documentation becomes really important as well as some, as some of the other items that we've mentioned on there in terms of accountability. Um, just to pick up on two things here as well, um, considering if you need to appoint a data protection officer, this applies only to certain types of organizations. Um, the concept of privacy by design in designing how you approach the processing and use of personal information is brought into law and there are some specific record keeping obligations as well. I've mentioned here um, some conditions for processing of personal information and just to pull out here that we need to look at where we rely on consent much um, more carefully as the ICO, our UK regulator, is very clear that consent should not be relied on unless um, there is no other more appropriate legal basis such as the ones we've mentioned on this slide. Just to um, spotlight on the rights of data subjects, individuals have existing rights under um, the Data Protection Act, which you can see here, such as to object to direct marketing and to access information. These ways, uh, th these rights have been um, crystallized and strengthened, for example, in terms of the timescales that you need to respond. And there are also new rights that are created, such as the right to be forgotten um, and the right of data portability, which means um, having access to the data that is held about you in a way which enables you to contact a new service provider. This is relevant in some circumstances. Um, and it's important to understand that there are also exceptions to these rights. So I'm now going to hand over to Chris, who's going to focus on the employment fundamentals. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a bit like today's weather, I fear that my section might depress um, some of you, especially the HR professionals. Um, but I will try my best um, to bring some sunshine and light in relation to this webinar. So I'm going to very quickly, as you can see, give you an executive summary. As Joe has quite rightly highlighted to you all, there's no escaping the fact that there's now a far more onerous environment for collecting and handling personal data. The level of the fines mean that we have to take on board the fact that it will be individuals conduct and behavior that will create the risk in respect of fines being applied by the Information Commissioner's Office and or further reputational damage. Um, as you can see, I'm highlighting this applies to all businesses. So those of you out there from small consultancies, I apologize now, there is no escape in respect to the GDPR, even if you are at the small end of the SME. 
for the HR professionals, I'm highlighting here to you on the third bullet point that it will require changes to HR policies. The obvious policy will be your existing data protection policy, which for many will not have been reviewed for many, many years. Um, and it will be probably um, hidden well within your staff handbook. But it's absolutely clear that before the 25th of May this year, that policy needs to be reviewed. As a result, a number of other policies will need to be considered as well. Now, in short, what I'm saying to you today is that all AC members process the personal data of the following, not just candidates, but you're also processing the data of employees and workers, former employees and workers, and of course, consultants. And this is irrespective of other activities within your businesses. So from a HR perspective, collaboration within um, your organizations is absolutely vital. This is not an exercise where HR alone can ensure compliance for the organization. And I say that in particular when it comes to data mapping, and understanding what revisions need to be made to relevant policies. You'll see in that final bullet point there that I'm highlighting three particular policies to highlight because you're going to have to consider what happens if someone has a complaint in respect of GDPR compliance. How are you going to handle that? You're also going to have to consider whistleblowing with regard to if there is are concerns about breach of legal obligations, especially if they are in the public interest. And of course, perhaps more importantly, you're going to have to consider ensuring that your disciplinary policy um, is up to date in respect of if you do have a breach scenario as a result of the misconduct of an employee. So quickly now moving to the use of consent cause clauses and this is why I hope I can bring some sunshine and light and tease myself in respect of as an employment lawyer for many years I have been inserting into employment contracts on clients behalf a data protection clause which invariably no one wants to read let alone get to grips with its true understanding what I have to say to you today is the fact that those clauses in existing employment contracts in summary are not worth the paper they're written on from the 25th of May onwards and will therefore require um, some thought and consideration as to how you're going to move towards compliance with the GDPR. The reason for that is, is very simple. It's very clear that compliance of the GDPR is going to make the use of consent in respect of employment contracts incredibly challenging because there is an inherent balance of power. And that is not what um, the GDPR is about because this is about rebalancing the rights of individuals, not employers. What I'm saying to you, therefore, is that relying on consent to justify the processing of employed personal data will be at a minimum difficult. My advice today is that you need to give very serious consideration of adopting alternative approaches in order to demonstrate compliance. And that's why I'm highlighting in the second bullet point, the ability for employers to use legitimate interests as well as performance of contract and compliance of legal obligations as a better basis for processing. What that leads you to is that if you accept that you want to take the safe ground of relying on those alternatives, is that you would not use a standard consent to process data clause in employment contracts. What you would do is that you would roll out new privacy notices. And you'll see in the, th in the final bullet point there, I'm highlighting that a generic one size fits all privacy notice is unlikely to be the, the solution you'll want as you will want privacy notices for job applicants and then revised ones for existing and then former employees. And just in case I haven't depressed you enough, I just want to highlight to you in particular um, the caution that we would recommend in respect of special category data, as we've highlighted to you earlier, what was formerly known as sensitive personal data. What I want to particularly highlight is the fact that employers on occasions need to get medical information in respect to their employees, be it around absence and or injury. What is clear 
is the fact that in processing that special category data, you would need to demonstrate that you're exercising a legal right or performing a legal obligation under employment law. So what you will need is, and if I draw a comparison with the working time regulations, you will need a document similar to a, um, a working time opt-out. So there's a clear agreement with informed and clear consent from the employee for the processing of that medical information um, for the exercise of those legal rights. As you can see from the next bullet point, that consent needs to be manifestly made public. So it has to be absolutely explicit and explained in straightforward language. Therefore, in addition to looking at policies and procedures, your existing employment contracts you will, and consideration of privacy notices, I'm also highlighting the fact that you will need a new separate document in respect of ensuring that you have the appropriate consent for the processing of special category data. That's probably more than enough from me. I'm gonna pass you back to Joe. Um, and so now over to Joe. Thank you, Chris. Um, so the GDPR is um, going to affect a lot of different areas of a business's operation. And one of the things it brings in um, is extraterritorial effect. So the, this is a slight, this is a difference, um, well, a clarification of the position under current law, but basically, um, the GDPR will apply to all businesses that are established in the EU um, and processing personal information in that context, but also to businesses that are not in the EU, not using um, servers in the EU, but offering goods and services in the EU or monitoring individuals in the EU. So um, if you're part of a large group and different parts of the group have um, direct relationships with EU data subjects, for example, in terms of um, e-commerce websites um, or use uh, of um, placing of cookies and um, using that for profiling activities and advertising, um, you need to consider whether the GDPR applies to your activities in that regard. So I, I want to focus on data breaches because this is another important change in the law from the GDPR. Um, under current law, if you suffer a data breach, for example, um, your personal data that you're processing has been lost or hacked or misused in some way, at the moment, there is no legal obligation to notify the regulator. This is going to change. Um, the GDPR brings in some specific situations where you need to tell the regulator and also tell individuals who have been affected by the breach that has occurred. Um, and the, 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 these requirements are quite stringent. So looking at them in more detail, mandatory notification of security breaches without undue delay um, and no later than 72 hours. This is not all breaches. Um, it's only really um, significant ones which cause a risk to people's rights and freedoms. Um, and there's some guidance actually um, on the Information Commissioner's website about um, guarding against um, the feeling that you need to report every single breach. Um, that being said, you still need to be in a position to deal with the significant breach if and when it occurs. Um, because if you notify the regulator late, even that alone could be an offence under the GDPR um, that could cause a fine. So late notification is only acceptable if there is a proper reasoned justification for your delay. Um, and it's not a reason to be late in notifying that you haven't yet got all the information about the breach. The, um, the regulator expects you to act quickly in notifying. And if you, you need to follow up with further information about exactly what has happened, you can do so. So what does this mean in practice? It's really important to recognize um, throughout your organization um, that this is a law. And so whoever first becomes aware of the breach, 
whether it is in a person in IT or in HR or elsewhere within your business, they need to know that this is an issue and to contact the relevant person quickly so that steps can be taken. If you are a subcontractor, a data processor, um, or if you are data sharing, um, you need to deal with these issues in your contracts as well so that proper cooperation in the event of a breach takes place to enable these report breach reporting to occur um, in the GDPR compliant way. You should be documenting the breach and what you do to put it right. Um, and yes, as part of the review of your overall policies and procedures, a data breach management incidents response um, policy is important. I mentioned also the obligation to notify individuals. Um, and again, you know, this is where there is a high risk to um, the rights and freedoms of the individuals. Um, now here, your IT systems can help you um, to because there's an exception that is worth being aware of. So for example, if there is a, a laptop containing databases of personal information that has been lost um, and the information that can be accessed um, is sensitive, so therefore the information being compromised could pose high risks to individuals. Um, it is an exception to your obligation to notify all individuals concerned if you can show that you have appropriate technical and organizational protections in place. For example, appropriate encryption and security levels um, to protect the relevant data. And that, that's not just um, surface level, but I suppose it involves a consideration of what personal data is involved. Um, are there layers of protection within your systems to protect um, particularly sensitive information, appropriate access controls, um, all of those sorts of things. But um, uh, one thing I would say is that they were quite lucky in the UK that we have a, 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 a business friendly practical regulator. So they will take proper regard to the kinds of steps that you have taken to protect information in thinking about um, how they approach um, sanctions if anything goes wrong. So looking at data processes, I mentioned earlier that data processes have new legal obligations under the GDPR. So if that is your role, um, uh, you're primarily um, a subcontractor providing services to a controller, um, or if you are using processes, for example, hosting services providers, IT services providers, um, then you need to be aware of these requirements. So this is just a reminder of um, what a data processor is, uh, but um, the thing to note is that there are specific requirements to be included in the, mandated by the GDPR to be included in contracts between data controllers and data processors. There's no transitional period, so these contract terms need to be in place by the 25th of May. Um, so if you have a raft of suppliers involved in processing personal information for you, um, you need to be engaging in the process of updating contracts with all of them and just being mindful that this can take some time to implement. So the types of things that need to be included in the contracts between controllers and processors are um, similar to what exists under current law. Um, you can see proce um, processing data only on the instructions of the data controller, um, but there are also some more specific requirements that the GDPR brings in, such as an a restriction on engaging sub-processors without the controller's consent and being much more transparent about the supply chain that's involved in the processing of personal information. Um, so the direct obligations on processes are primarily around security measures. They will have um, direct obligations to implement um, technical and organizational measures to secure the data um, and also to keep records of data processing. Um, and if they qualify, they may also have to appoint a data protection officer um, and they may, uh, if they are based outside the EU, but our processing data relating to data subjects have to appoint an EU representative. So we, um, there's, there's a lot of information um, in terms of which can impact various different aspects of your business um, in terms of getting ready for the GDPR, some of which you would, have to, uh, you, you would be aware of already and others which you may not have thought about. Um, so 
where do you start? Um, and many businesses um, are in this process, the ones we talk to, um, there are different stages really. Um, some businesses are well underway, others are starting just now, others are really just um, only um, raising awareness within the organization at this stage. Um, I mean, typically, the way to start is to review and get a clear picture for yourself of what personal information you hold as a business. Um, and Chris mentioned that this is very much a collaboration exercise. Even in, um, you know, in an SME, this is not a task for just one department within the business. As you can see, this will impact IT functions, finance functions, HR functions, marketing functions. So it's important to have um, someone within your organization who is taking overall charge of um, getting a clear picture of personal information that is processed in all these kinds of activities. Um, and once you do that, you can work out um, what your practices ought to be in order to comply. So you can work out what you need to, um, uh, what, what, you can work out the legal basis that applies to your processing of personal information in all those contexts. And as Chris mentioned, um, we need to look more carefully at consent. So anywhere where we are currently relying on consent, we need to specifically think about that in a little bit more detail because this is um, this is uh, something which, if we're relying on consent, the requirements for a GDPR compliant consent are quite strict, and um, most organisations at the moment um, may not meet them in to, in the way that they're approaching the capture of consent. Um, we need to look at data retention policies, um, data collection policies for customers, for website visitors, um, data sharing agreements that we might have with suppliers, um, and uh, data transfer agreements. We need to look at um, where we're processing personal information in different contexts and make sure that our policies address those contexts. Um, and, uh, and hand in hand with that, we need to look at the practical steps that we take um, to protect that information. Um, so how do we how do we secure that information? and how do we um, how do we ensure that when it comes to the the point at which we no longer need that information, do we have a process to dis to deal with that um, in an appropriate way? So really, um, taking a step back, um, some key preparation questions that we thought we'd, we'd set out um, at a high level. What personal data is processed within your organization? Where is it? Where is it transferred to and from? In particular, to identify any cross-border issues and any third parties who have access to personal information and the security aspects of it. Um, and that will enable you to get a picture of what steps you then need to take to to um, ensure compliance. I've set out here a couple of articles um, that uh, we've written and also um, the, in, the UK Information Commissioner's website has got a lot of information that is available for um, for businesses in terms of getting ready and in particular I wanted to mention the 12 steps to prepare that they have um, they have issued which is uh, uh, which says in a similar way to to what we've done here um, what you can do to, to to get yourself ready on a high level um, and they've also issued a fairly detailed guide to um, GDPR obligations for organizations to help them to comply. So we've left sufficient time to take questions um, and um, Chris is going to have a look at what questions there are and kick off with that. Hi Joe. Yes, um, there looks like despite my initial depression um, that there's a couple of questions already for myself from the employment angle. So Joe, if it's okay, I'll give you a quick break. Um, first question that's come in, it regards consent. 
and quite understandable question about how do we deal with existing staff um, and the question basically is will we need to get all staff to sign new consent forms so really in respect to that question it breaks it breaks itself down into two aspects so in dealing with existing staff what I would expect is at a given point before the 25th of May the, the business will notify all staff of the necessary changes as a result of the GDPR. Um, it's, there's no prescription as to how a business does that, but there will need to be a form of notification, not, not least as there will need to be the rollout perhaps of some new HR policies, for example, and therefore we would expect there to be an information sharing exercise. When that occurs, it's common sense then at that stage to also be explaining and set the expectation that there will perhaps be a new privacy notice for all existing employees which they will need to sign up to for the processing of their data. Um, life might then become a bit more challenging if you have employees saying they won't sign those privacy notices but let's be optimistic and work on the basis that they understand the reasons why and that they are completed. Um, the second aspect is um, in relation to getting all staff to sign new consent forms. I just reiterate, um, my advice basically is, is that consent is going to be very challenging in respect to generally processing employee data. I would highly recommend serious consideration to using the use of legitimate interests, which lends itself to giving all employees a privacy notice with an explanation of what it is and a, requ a requirement that that is done before the 25th of May. Um, the other question immediately that's come in, um, again yeah. related to the HR side of things, is along the lines of was read somewhere about linking breaches of GDPR to disciplinaries? Um, yes, that I certainly envisage that employers and certainly AC members if they are misfortunate enough to have to make a a serious data breach notification to the ICO as Joe was explaining to the want to give serious consideration to whether that is misconduct and what the future for that particular employee may be in those circumstances so it makes absolute sense to link it to the disciplinary policy um, and the other aspect of this question is um, about rewarding staff for complying with the GDPR. What do, what do we think of this? My immediate reaction is um, I'm not too impressed by the concept of rewarding staff to comply with the GDPR because in due course it should become business as usual. So if I apply the current situation under the Data Protection Act for the last 20 years, we have not been specifically rewarding through bonus or incentive um, arrangements, staff to comply with the Data Protection Act. So, Joe, I've got a question here for you, um, very straightforward one, but very pertinent one, asking, can AC members still buy marketing lists? Yeah, yes. Um, so, I, just, to, just to pick up on the earlier question about um, uh, disciplinaries briefly um, before I go on to, to talk about the marketing lists point. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the importance of employee training. Um, so we've had issues where I have been working quite closely with um, a member of the employment team in the context of a disciplinary action that was being taken or a warning that was being given to an employee um, relating to data loss um, and I think it's quite a useful story because um, it shows how staff members um, have been with all the best will in the world can cause a cause a data loss and um, a significant one which causes a breach um, but how the regulator approaches this if you have taken a, um, appropriate steps to train and this was just a, a situation where um, staff wanted to carry out work off-site on, um, on a database which involved um, personal information download the, that information onto a USB stick and that was subsequently lost containing a lot of personal information including relating to um, health issues. Um, it was very helpful in that situation to be able to show in detail the training that the specific employee involved had attended. Um, so just on the question of marketing lists, this is a hot topic for, um, uh, for in the, with the changes of the data protection 
um, regulations. And there are some more laws that are coming into place um, that uh, impact this as well. So with marketing lists, um, it, uh, the, the marketing data that you could buy could be um, could differ in in various ways it could be business to consumer or business to business i'm assuming here that you're probably dealing with business to business um, so marketing lists um, containing postal addresses and names for non-electronic marketing um, the rules don't greatly change for non-electronic marketing um, it's just that the individual has got to um, has got the right to opt out. Um, when you're using this uh, marketing lists and you're buying them, um, you need to show diligence in terms of the source of information and also think about um, whether or not you really are going to be able to use that information um, going going forward, um, because you need to. Okay, so let's say there's a database of um, finance directors, um, their companies, their postal address, and their email address. Um, under current law, we have the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, which sits side by side with the Data Protection Act, and that creates some um, specific rules about um, electronic marketing, which at the moment don't apply to corporate email addresses. Um, they don't apply to, um, in, in the sense that they don't require the specific opt-in for emailing to corporate addresses. Um, Alongside the GDPR, there is a planned new regulation, which is currently in draft form. So the draft e-privacy regulations. Originally, the um, EU Parliament was hoping that they would be finalized and become law at the same time as the GDPR, but they've been quite heavily debated. Um, so they're not yet in force. But one of the things that the e-privacy regulations is set to do is to change that position and require opt-ins for B2B email marketing. So, um, you know, uh, this can this will change business practices quite considerably. It's still being heavily lobbied against, um, and we don't know where we will end up with it yet, but it's definitely a kind of a, a watch this space. I would say that if you are buying databases, you need to be... Um, at the moment, the, the database industry is undergoing tremendous change um, because they sell they sell databases where individuals have opted in generically to receive marketing. Um, and this is where the importance of GDPR standard consent comes in, because GDPR standard consent requires the consent to be specific and unambiguous and, and um, a clear intention of the individual's wishes. Um, and, and they don't regard that uh, consent can be specific enough if it doesn't identify the third parties who are actually um, covered by that consent. Um, at the moment, the requirement is to identify those third parties by name. Um, so it's quite a high standard. Um, so the answer is, I'm not sure you will be able to buy marketing lists in a way that you can rely on. And if you are considering doing it, you need to think about it much more carefully in terms of the, insur the assurances that you get from your suppliers um, to make sure that you really can use that information for what you're going to um, plan to do with it. And it's also a bit of a watch this space with the e-privacy regulations as well. Thank you, Joe. Um, that was obviously a, a, a long question as it turned out to answer. Um, we're being overwhelmed. This is great. The, the engagement today is fantastic. And so to help manage people's expectations, um, questions that you're putting forward to us, if we don't answer them, we will come back to um, each and every one of those questions um, after this webinar. So please keep them going. There's a very straightforward question that we've received, which is whether the slides will be made available um, after this webinar. The answer is a very firm yes from the ACE. That will be managed from the ACE. Um, but Joe, I've got another question for you, if I can dodge a bullet here, um, which is, um, I think, a very pertinent one, given um, the way of the world today. And it's along the lines of what what do we need to do if an existing employee refuses to sign? Sorry, I'm reading the wrong question. Can you clarify, sorry, Joe, how the GDPR affects the use of social media? Oh, 
Um, the use of social media. Well, I guess the first question is the use of social media um, for what? Um, if you're using the so social media for marketing your organization, um, then in I mean, this is a question that really, I suppose, is very important in terms of, in, to consider the social media privacy policies that individuals sign up to and how they use it and to make sure that you're using it in line with those policies. Um, but it's quite a broad question, so I'm not sure um, how specific I can be with, with, with the answer. But really, I think... Um, here, the principles of being transparent about what you're doing, um, considering uh, considering the you know what you're doing with that data or what you're intending to do with that data, um, and making sure that you tell people about it is important. And one more thing to mention that we haven't um, mentioned yet in much detail is privacy notices. So there are two specific regulations within the GDPR which talk about information that needs to be given to individuals. One is if you are collecting information from individuals, you have to tell them some specific things, who you are, you know, your contact details, um, your, the, you know, what the, your legal basis for processing, um, you know, how the individuals can exercise their rights, all of those kinds of things. Um, but also, there's a specific rule about when you ha you are processing information that you have not collected directly from the individual. So you have received it from some third party and you are using it for your own purposes as a data controller. Um, and in those circumstances, you have to specifically tell individuals the source from which you got their information. So I hope that helps to address that question. It certainly does, Joe. And, and what I'll do now is I, I'll, I will now answer the question I started to, to, to quote to you, um, which is really for me. And that's along the lines of what do we do if an existing employee refuses to sign a new privacy notice? Um, well, clearly that would be a regrettable situation if you work on the basis that you accept what we're saying in respect to prior notification. To Joe's point earlier with regard to the importance of the prior training to explain the need for it. Well, you have a, a difficult employee who's just saying, we will not agree and will not be subject to a privacy notice. Then I'm a, I regret that you're getting into the territory of having to consider a dismissal um, for such practical things as how would you be able to pay them, for example? Um, how would you be able to operate your HR policies? Now, I would hope, being a practical employment lawyer, that when that is spelt out to the individual, they might have a change of mind. But um, as I say, you, you never can tell sometimes what, what strange things can happen in the world of, of work. Um, so I hope that deals with that question sufficiently. Um, sure. Joe, I've got another question for you, if I may. And that is along the lines of, are companies able to send data to non-EU countries which may not have these safeguards in place? Oh, yes. So this reflects um, the position under current law, which is that you cannot transfer personal information to non-EU countries um, without ensuring that um, there are adequate steps in place. And so one of the things that, you, that, that um, I think the question was alluding to was there are some countries that have been regarded as safe recipients. So if you have a, um, a contract with a data processor located in New Zealand, you don't have to worry about that because they've got great data protection laws that our um, EU regulators think are uh, absolutely fine, which means that um, they regard the data as being sufficiently protected if it goes to countries like that. So New Zealand, um, Canada, there's a handful really of them. Um, other countries like the US, India, China, um, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world, um, which are not on the white list that has been issued by the EU, you need to take 
further steps. So these steps can be, um, can, uh, there are different types of things you can do. Um, the most common is to ensure that um, there are contractual safeguards in place. So at the moment, there are some approved forms of contracts which can be used between you and the data recipient, um, which basically means that the data recipient contractually agrees to treat that data in accordance with EU data protection principles. Um, uh, th th there are some issues with the use of them because they're currently being challenged um, in the European court. Some of you may have um, heard in the press um, a few years ago about the safe harbor. Um, the safe harbor was a system of self um, certification in the US, meaning that if you were transferring personal information from the EU to the US, um, an organization in the US could self-certified that they would adhere to the EU data protection principles and thereby be able to be a safe and acceptable recipient of that personal information. That was challenged and fell through. Um, and there's a new system called the Privacy Shield for the US entities. So if you're transferring data to um, a Privacy Shield authorized entity, that is again acceptable. But I would say, um, whether you're using the model clauses or transferring data to a privacy shield accredited um, entity, um, this again is a watch this space environment because the current model clauses um, are still a valid way of um, transferring data to a non-EU recipient, but they are drafted to work with the Data Protection Act and other current such laws, we will expect new GDPR compliant ones to be issued. Um, and when that happens, you will have to update your clauses with the um, with the new ones um, for your processes or, or other controllers in different parts of the the world. Um, and uh, for the privacy shield, uh, I think if you are transferring data to a US entity, it's worth asking them if they are privacy shield um, authorized. So if you're selecting um, a, a hosting provider um, for the group overall, um, and you have different parts of the group located within the EU and outside, um, you, if you're if you're unable to select hosting in the EU only, um, and you need to go to the States for whatever reason, it's worth selecting a Privacy Shield accredited um, provider, because that is something that will facilitate the data transfer. Thank you, Joe. Um, Joe, um, there are loads of questions that are coming in for you. So I'll let you draw breath, but it's actually a follow up question on the flip side of a question that you just answered a, a moment ago in relation to privacy notices. So the a follow up questions come in. Will this mean that when I receive a call from a third party, will they be legally obligated to advise me where they obtained my details? Uh, yes. Um, they should. They they should do. Um, they um, yep. They should tell you who they are, who, where they got your. Uh, and they, they may not tell you on the phone call. They may. Um, I don't think that is an obligation. The obligation is to make sure that um, they give you a notice. Um, so if you if you want to know more information, um, they, you know they can send it to you as a follow up email. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge if you are, uh, but from a consumer perspective, it's useful because then you are able to track who may have then supplied data of yours to someone else without your permission. And I think this is part of the strengthening of rights of individuals that the GDPR is all about. Um, from the flip side, if you are an organization carrying out marketing, um, even if somebody has opted in directly to receive marketing from you, you need to bear in mind that if you're sending text marketing or email marketing, you will need to ensure that you encapsulate all their required information. Okay, thank you, Joe. Well, don't rest there. Um, <laughs> there. There is, from my perspective, a really good practical questions and it's along the lines of um, can AC members contact a prospective client on the basis of basis of a meeting where they've exchanged business business cards 
Yes, this question, uh, it's, 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 um, it's a tricky question. I think we've got, we're going to, you know, the, at the moment, we rely on implied consent, really. Uh, if somebody gives you the business card, they expect to be contacted afterwards. Um, I think going forward, what we're going to see is a slight change in the practices that, you know, where the, you exchange the business cards. Um, ideally, in the ideal compliance world, um, you know, uh, when you're receiving the card, you would say, may I contact you? for before adding somebody to your CRM system to receive all your newsletters, may I add you to my database um, and get a yes, and then you can record that. Or if not, if you just um, receive a business card, rather than regarding the act of having received the business card as an opt-in for all marketing material, you should send an email asking, can I send, can I add you to our database for further marketing? Um, if they say yes, then you add them in. Um, so b the reason is that under the GDPR, it's really important to be able to demonstrate consent. The law specifically says that consent must be demonstrable. Um, so if you're just receiving the business card, you can't show that consent is specific and informed in order to demonstrate it. And I think this this links with another useful point about how you manage your CRM systems. Um, at the moment, most businesses do not record where the consent was obtained, even if they have obtained a consent. And I think this is a practice that needs to be improved um, in the GDPR world. Thank you, Joe. And as we're fast approaching running out of time, I just want to make um, a simple point, which is to AC members that look, given the volume of questions, obviously we'll be following up on them, but if Pennington's Manchester can be of any further assistance to you, please don't hesitate to contact us um, because there's such a wide range of questions coming through. It's a shame for us that we didn't actually put this webinar up for a bit longer. So, Joe, I'm going to duck the last question. I'm going to pass it to you. Um, and it's again a very good practical question um, focusing this time on perhaps the smaller AC members who can't afford to employ someone full-time to look after GDPR. I expect there's many AC members in that situation and the practical question is how independent must the data controller um, be? Okay so I think this question relates to the data protection officer and the obligation to have a data protection officer um, and not all organizations have to have a data protection officer. Um, the rules are that you will, as a business, you will need to have um, a data protection officer if either you carry out um, large scale processing of personal data or you carry out um, a significant amount of processing of special category personal data. So for the first question is, do I fall within the ambit of needing to appoint a data protection officer? If you are a small organization, probably not. Um, if you do have to have a data protection officer, there are rules about that, um, about uh, how independent this individual needs to be um, and uh, the level of reporting to the board, that the access to the board that they need to have. Um, if you decide not to follow the data protection officer's recommendations, um, you need to have good reasons why. Uh, and, and this is an area where there is quite a bit of guidance already um, from the ICO and from um, the European uh, regulators um, board. So, um, so firstly, hopefully you don't need to have one. Secondly, if you do need to have one, um, there's guidance available. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. So I think it just falls on me to um, thank all of the attendees for today's webinar. Um, apologies in respect of not having enough time to answer the questions, but as we say, we will follow up um, post webinar. Um, we sincerely hope that you have a very good rest of the day. Thank you very much on behalf of Joe and myself. Thank you.